Thanks. <clears throat> so I'm going to talk today about fungi. And this is, a, this is the seal of mycology from Berkeley. Next slide, please. And this is the title that I've got today, Secret Life of Fungi, What DNA Sequencing Reveals About Fungi. And the next slide says a little more about what I'm really going to talk about. I'm going to talk about fungi and how they adapt. <coughs> so the first half of the talk is going to be more general, and the second um, half is going to be sort of the latest research that we're doing. And I would encourage you to ask me questions as we go along. I'd rather that uh, we understood, you understood what I said, that said it in a um, coherent way, than that we got through every slide and you didn't understand. Okay. Next slide. So this is where we're headed in the first half of the talk. Uh, what are fungi? Where are they in the tree of life? Uh, what's inside the fungal kingdom? And how do fungi earn a living? So this is the organism that people think of when they think of fungi, the mushroom. And there are actually two mushrooms there. There's a big lepiota and then way at the base is a little armillaria. And this is about the last picture of, of a mushroom you're going to see in this talk. Because I want to tell you, since I've got a captive audience, about the other fungi. Next slide. But I'm going to talk about the parts of the mushroom. So when you see the mushroom, you're seeing one part. And the other two parts here, there's the, the business end of the fungus, of the mushroom, is in the ground here. And it could be decaying plant material. It could be um, a mutualist a sy in, sy in a symbiosis with the roots of plants. Um, it could be a parasite of plants. So that's part number two. And part number three is the spores that are coming out. I think I now have an advancer, is that right? Or is it a, it's a... Just, um, just a little bit. <laughs> Sorry. So there are really three parts. There's the mushroom, the spores, and the mycelium underground. You might want to, if you want to go back, go for it. I'm, I'm the door, door guy. Okay. <laughs> Next slide. So this is what that underground part looks like. It's made up of little filaments called hyphae. And there are little threads. 10 millionths of a meter in diameter. And if you stain them, you can see nuclei inside of them. They have all the organelles that you'd expect in any cell of any eukaryote. In other words, a plant or an animal or a fungus. They're very tiny. Next slide. And what they do, they live inside their food and they grow inside the food. They export enzymes, break down biopolymers, import the monomers, exhausted the food where they're living and they just grow into new food. And so, I'm going to go play with the computer here for a second. There's a nice seat watch right that, here watch, that watch I, oh. I abandoned. So if somebody doesn't like their seat, they could sit there. Somebody who doesn't have a seat, there's a nice seat over there. There's a wire panel. So this is uh, from my colleague at Berkeley, Louise Glass. And this is, I think, is going to work. It's a little movie. Oh, cool. So what happened there is that this hyphae was growing forward. And then it's also going to start a branch. So they're very simple. Next slide. But they cooperate to make a mycelium, to make a colony. And so we were looking at the tips, and if you look back in the colony, they start to organize themselves and make cross bridges. And on a petri dish, they look really stupid. They just grow in all directions. But if you put them in an environment where the food is not evenly distributed, they'll find the food in one place, and they send out search, searching hyphae to find it again. And when they do, they send the hyphae in that direction, not the other way. Next slide. Now, I talked about spores. So fungi can make a lot of spores. This is a wood rotting fungus, another basidium mycete, Phomatopsis, really common in the Sierra Nevada. Next slide. And if you get the light right by one of these, this is a Gargantoderma from actually from South Africa. You can see the spores coming out. And they can produce a trillion spores per year. And the earth is not covered in Ganoderma. So two of those do not reliably make 
McDermott. Otherwise, in about 60 years, you'd have the mass of the Earth. So they're making a trillion spores, and one of them makes a very different strategy than a mammal. Even little fungi, these, this is an ascomycete pet fungus, and its reproductive structure is about as big as, the, as your little fingernail. And even a little one of those can produce 100 million spores, and they shoot them instead of just letting them drift out. And they shoot them um, in a simultaneous manner that generates a, a current of air and carries them higher in the air. And the game for all fungi is to get their spores above the boundary layer of air next to the earth so that they can be blown away, so that they disperse. So either they make a mushroom to get them up and then drop them, or they make a cup and they shoot them up, or they get an, an animal or water or something to help them move them. The hyphae are similar in almost all fungi. I'm going to show you a couple of exceptions. It's the reproductive structures where the variation is. Next slide. Now I said hyphae are everywhere. Yeah. So I have a question. What do you mean by the boundary layer? Does that mean like up to the photosphere? No, it means right next to the ground. So oh. the air that isn't moving very fast. And then oh. if you, as you go up, you can sense the air is moving. But if you're right next to the ground, there's so oh. much friction that there's no movement. Oh, I see. Just to get them up maybe a couple to feet. A few inches okay. is enough. Good question. So I said most fungi make these hyphae or filamentous, but not all fungi are filamentous. And this is the most famous of all fungi, although I bet you some of you didn't know it was the fungus. It's yeast. So this is famous because um, the baking industries and the alcoholic beverage industry are all based on this little guy. doesn't make any hyphae. It makes single cells. There are, again, about 10 millionths of a micron in diameter. They have a volume about 1,000 times a bacterial cell. So they're bigger than bacteria, but they have a very similar life cycle. They don't grow into their food. The food diffuses to them. Next slide. Baking industry. Brewing industry. Next slide. Now, the third form that fungi take is the, the ancestral form, I think, the basal form. And in this case, they make cells that can swim, that have their own multiple power. So go forward one slide then. Okay, so there is a flagellum. Okay. So what's, what you see here, this is the fungus. Does anybody know what that is? A food particle? It is, it's a food particle. It's a pine pollen grain. So this is a little beast. And it, what it, the zoospore, these are called zoospores, the ones that have flagellum. They insist on the pine pollen, and they make little hyphae into the pollen grain. So this is an older one that's grown to mature size, and now its cytoplasm has broken up to make more zoospores. And then they're released, and they swim around and find new food. So they can search for their food instead of just randomly drifting. And if they land on a good spot, great. And the all but one out of a trillion that don't, bad luck. So the, those are the three shapes. Hyphae, most common. Yeast, next most common. Least common, um, zoospores. Next slide. OK, so now where are fungi in the tree of life? Next slide. So the, the biggest, one of the biggest discoveries um, when we started, first, when we first started to be able to use DNA variation to understand how fungi were, were related to each other was that animals, the metazoa, had an evolutionary link with fungi. <coughs> People who studied fungi were always in botany departments from the early 1800s on, because it was assumed that fungi were plants. They didn't move, except for the zoospore fungi, which was a clue. Um, and so they were studied by botanists. And it was a shock when um, people in Mitch Silken's lab uh, found that, in fact, fungi are closer relatives of animals than either are of plants. So Rod and I shouldn't have been in the biology department. I should have been in zoology. Or in our own department. Next slide. Actually, Rod should have been in botany, but I should have So this is a tree based on relationships, based on variation in DNA. And here is, are, are the fungi right here? 
Next slide. And there are the animals. So we're actually quite closer to each other than either are to the plants. Here's the green plants over here. And if I'm sure some of you, some of you in the audience have athlete's foot, you may even have fungi growing in your toenails. Yeah. <laughs> and you'll find that it's very hard to cure that. Yeah. And the reason is that we share a lot of biochemistry with fungi. There aren't <laughs> many targets to kill a fungus that doesn't also kill you. <laughs> Whereas bacteria are several billion years separated, and there are a lot more targets for bacteria. So fungi are tough to kill, yeah. This is off topic, but are all those things from circozoa, alveolates, those other things, are those all bacteria and viruses? No, that's a good question. None of these are bacteria or viruses. These are all eukaryotes, organisms that have nuclei, like we do. The bacteria are down where it says the root of the tree, and you notice there's some indecision about where the root goes. Yeah. <laughs> so we have a lot of data to, to tell. The data are really good to tell what groups are, but how the groups are related to each other is really hard to understand because those divergences happened a long time ago. And, and the signal-to-noise ratio is low because in the <coughs> intervening time, there's been a lot of noise in terms of mutation. Next question. Next slide. So what this means, if you think about it, plants make macroscopic structures, trees, right, that are multicellular. <coughs> We're an example of an animal that's large and multicellular. And fungi also do it and make um, multicellular structures like mushrooms. But the ancestor, the common ancestor of plants, fungi, animals, wasn't multicellular. It was a <coughs> unicell. So each of these groups has independently developed large multicellular organisms with differentiated tissues, which is interesting that that, that paralleled several times. And it can give us also an idea of what the last common ancestor here of animals and fungi must have looked like. It was probably, it was a unicellular organism. It probably had a cell wall. Fungi have cell walls, plants have cell walls. Animals probably lost them. And it was almost certainly had a single posterior flagellum. Next slide. And so here's a fungal zoospore with a single posterior flagellum, and here's some horse sperm, single posterior flagella. So we have a relationship with animals. Next slide. Okay, what's inside the fungal kingdom? I guess then I'm also going to talk about how do they move. Oh, so I want to point out that. The study of what's inside the fungal, fungal kingdom, and in fact, that other tree I showed you too, was helped greatly by some work done in 1990 at Berkeley by these four people on how to, how to directly sequence DNA from any organism by amplifying the DNA rather than having to clone it. It made a huge change. Next slide. And these are the four authors now celebrating the fact that that publication made its 10,000th citation this week. <laughs> so I'm going to start at the bottom and work my way up. Here are animals, the outgroup for the fungi. Microsporidia, I think, should be included in the fungi, um, but I'm not going to talk about them. They're, they're interesting organisms. They're obligate parasites. They were really obscure until HIV and AIDS, and then they caused an intestinal disease in humans, and then people start to look at them. They're everything from insects to mammals. Um, but they have very reduced genomes and almost very little morphology. But I'm going to talk about rosella. This is the, the basal fungus, as far as we know. Next slide. And these are photographs taken in the 1940s by my predecessor, Ralph Emerson who worked on this fungus. And here's a rosella resistant spore, and it's an obligate parasite inside another fungus, Allomyces. Mm -hmm. And uh, we have no idea this is a basal fungus until it was sequenced in a, in a survey of fungi. It turned out it was the first branching fungus. Now there's an interesting philosophical problem here. If you'll go back one slide. Yeah. So here's rosella. It's a parasite. Of, a, of an organism in this group, which diverged later. So how can something be a parasite of something that wasn't around when it evolved? Two possibilities. One, it became a parasite later. 
It's possible. Two, it's wrong. That this is evolving really rapidly and misleads the, the method of, of tree building. Both of those are possible. There are an awful lot of obligate parasites at the basis of trees in many groups of organisms. It makes me wonder if that's an artifact. Next one. So there's Rosella. Next one. So now we're going to go to the Catriomycota. Rosella makes these spores that have single posterior flagella, can swim around. So does the Neocalamastigomycota, so does the Catriomycota, so does the Blastocladiomycota. So let's take a look at the, a member of the Catriomycota next. So the Catriomycota are famous now because they're killing amphibians, one species has polished off about 30% of amphibian species worldwide. And it's symptomatic or an example of the problem when you move an organism from one part of the world to another part of the world, and it encounters naive hosts that haven't evolved them. And we don't know where this fungus comes from, but we know where it's done damage, Australia, Central America, and now Europe, North America, etc. <coughs> Next slide. So this is in the Sierra Nevada. This is Vance Riedenberg, who's at um, San Francisco State University. And Jess Morgan was a postdoc with me. We did some population genetics of this fungus in the Sierra Nevada. And the Sierra Nevada yellow-legged frog is just about on the way out um, due to this fungus. And this is not the only example worldwide. Next slide. Now we'll have a more positive example in the glomeromycota. Next slide. So these are fungi that are, are mutualists, they're symbionts, and they form a thing called a mycorrhizae, literally a fungus root. So here's the root of a plant, and the fungus grows in that root, and it makes these little, these things called arbuscles. They're like little trees, little branching trees, and the hypha pushes in through the wall of the plant cell, but doesn't break the plant membrane. And it ramifies into many little branches for exchange of material between the plant cell and the fungus. The plant gets phosphorus and water from the fungus, and the fungus gets sugar from the plant. So the fungus is living on the plant, but the plant root, instead of exploiting just the little area of the soil around the root, can now exploit everywhere that the hyphae go out of the root, which improves the volume more than a thousand fold. So it's a good, it's apparently a good deal for the plant and for the fungus. They also make these little vesicles that we're not sure what they do, and they make spores outside that replicate the fungus. Now what's interesting about this next slide is that if you look in the earliest <coughs> land plant fossils where they have differentiated tissues, and this is a plant, a rhinia, that doesn't even have roots yet. Roots haven't evolved. It's got an underground stem, and it's got an aerial stem, reproductive structures. Next slide. And there's some beautifully preserved fossils in Scotland in the Rhiney Church. And here's one of these arbuscles in a modern glomalase, these little branch structures in the cell of, of the root. And here's an arbuscle in a, in a polished fossil from the Devonian. Um, before plants even had roots. So you can make the argument, the two arguments there. One is when plants came onto land, they came with a fungus, and roots evolved to support mycorrhizae. And 90% of, of uh, plants on Earth have this kind of mycorrhiza, or muscular mycorrhiza, very common. Next slide. Now we're going to go to the astromycota. E everything we've talked about so far, from the glomeromycota down to rosella, about 1 or 2 percent of known fungi. That's partly a bias because they're so small, people don't see them a lot. Ascomycota, about 65 percent of described fungi. Next, yeah. What level of taxonomy is that? Um, well, these are all considered um, uh, phyla. They're considered phyla. So the age here, the date on the divergence of animals and the fungi, the last common ancestor, was about a billion years ago. So it's the kingdom fungi. And so myco that mycota ending means it's a phylum. Next slide. So here, ascomycota are famous social 
If I, you know, if I'm not seeing hands in the background, you can yell out. So there are many cheeses that rely on ascomycota. So Penicillium roquefortii is a famous one. Penicillium camembertii and also Geotrichum candidum are involved in making camembert. A lot of Asian foods uh, involve Aspergillus oryzae and some yeast. And then, of course, there are lots of antibiotics and other drugs beginning with penicillin, which is made from penicillium now ruber, I think. It's got a, it used to be penicillium notatum, then it was penicillin chrysogenum. A little more work was done. It turns out the type of chrysogenum is not in the same clade as the one that makes penicillin, so it's got a new name now. Yeah? Aspergillus? Is no, but I'm going to get to that. Aspergillus oryzae is a, um, a workhorse of industrial mycology. And show you soy sauce uh, absolutely depends on it. It's a very close relative of Aspergillus flavus, which does produce a carcinogen. And, um, but interestingly, the strains um, that were domesticated in Asia don't, they have some of the genes in the pathway, but not all of them. They don't produce aflatoxin. And you know that in, in the development of those, the develop, development of that fermentation, you know that there had to be some nasty mistakes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and the big companies like Kikomen, I think they check their, their fermentations like every two hours to make sure they're okay, because that would be the end of them. They made a mistake. Excellent. So here's what you were talking about. Oh, that's the here's Aspergillus flavus over there, and it grows on it grows on fruits that are dried. And you botanists know that nuts, and you know you know that for example, each corn kernel is a fruit, and so stored corn is the problem. Peanuts, almonds that are infected, and actually, my wife's father was an entomologist, and he worked on the navel orange worm, which puts, puts holes in almond fruits. And when that happens, Aspergillus flavus gets into the sea, into the nut. So, and there is aflatoxin. So there are good things and bad things. Next slide. Finally, we got back to the basidial mycota, which I started with, and you'll see why in a second. So we're back to the mushroom. Okay. Now, I've showed you, I showed you a mushroom, and I showed you a um, a wood, wood rotting fruit body, the one that made a trillion spores. But there's some other sorts of fruiting bodies. Next slide. So this is a fruiting body of a basidium I see growing the door jam of one of my friend's houses in Santa Monica. Um, that was the first work I ever, I was just at Berkeley and Ken Sleeper called me up and he said, I think I have a problem with my house. And so I went, I went down and looked at it, and it was the most amazingly decayed home I've ever seen. There was no foundation. <laughs> Fortunately, he sold it to a developer who built, a, built a, uh, an apartment house. But that's the fruiting body. Next slide. And Basidio mycota also make mycorrhizae. So they make this association with the roots of plants, but not our buscular mycorrhizae ectomycorrhiza. And here you can see a mantle of fungal hyphae growing on pine roots. So instead of making a long root, the pine makes a little fork branch root. And again, it's the same story. The fungus gets sugar from the plant, and the plant, in this case, gets phosphorus, gets water. And also, these fungi can break down um, biomass in the soil, so it can get some nitrogen from the fungus, too. And a big tree will donate 15 or 20 percent of its photosynthetic output to these fungi because they increase its capacity to, to mine the soil, basically. And my colleague Tom Brunson Berkeley is an expert on this. Be a good speaker, too. Next slide. So now um, I'm going to shift from this overview of fungi to the latest kind of research that we and the reason I want to put this in here is when you look at one of these phylogenetic trees, which is made by comparing genes that we've sequenced from representatives of each of these phyla, um, 
usually a few genes. Initially, one gene, the one that that paper was involved in, one, or one group of genes in the ribosomal region. But each of these divergences, so you can see if you start at the base, there's a split, and then there's another split, or there's a split, and a split, and a split, and a split. Each of those, next slide. Each of those spots is where a single species, at some point in the past, split into two groups, and each went their own way. They adapted differently to the environment. Okay. So that's divergence, that's splitting. And it has to be followed by adaptation to somehow use that environment differently, or one or both of those populations that just as diverse will go extinct just by chance. Next slide. So we have to have adaptation. Next. So we wanted to study adaptation in the worst way, but we didn't know how to do it. Okay. And the example that our, our uh, leaders in this are people who study animals. <coughs> and a great piece of work is done in Arizona by Hopi Hoekstra and Michael Nachman. And it's where the lava flows have occurred in the desert. Next slide. So here's the next slide. Lava and sand, OK? So almost instantaneously, the environment has changed. So you have mice that have lived on the sand, and suddenly there's this environment. Next slide. So what happens is they evolve adaptive coats. So there's the sand morph and the lava morph. And if you put them on the wrong substratum, you can really spot them. And so, of course, you get a hawk, a coyote. So you can imagine that there's very strong natural selection to evolve a coat color that lets you match the substrate. And so Hoekstra and Nachman and others then, realizing that that was going to involve the melanin synthesis pathway, looked at genes in this pathway, and sure enough, they could see evidence of natural selection. So they could say selection, um, occurred and allowed these organisms to adapt to a difference in the environment. Next slide. So we wanted to do that with fungi. And so this is this is one of my favorite fungi, probably my favorite fungi. This is a an area in North Carolina where there'd been a controlled burn. Okay. Delia has an aunt who lives nearby, so we went there to bird watch and to botanize. And we're walking around. And I see these little spots all over this. And I realize, oh my gosh, that's Neurospora. That's one of my fungi. And this is what it looks like close up. You can see all these hyphae. And it's making male gametes. They call, they're called canidia. And they could, sometimes they function to reproduce it asexually. And they could do that, but it doesn't look like they really do. It looks like they function as gametes. And this is a fungus that eats plants, but it likes the plant cooked before it eats it. <laughs> Not charred, just cooked, killed. So we went, I went and got a bunch of sterile Q-tips at the pharmacy, and we went back and collected them. Because we have a big collection of these fungi. So then we wanted to, to think, like those mammologists, what could be the environmental factors, and what was the phenotype, and we could not come up with anything. We thought about it, we tried things, we got nowhere. So when you get nowhere with these things, next slide. You what you do in science is you build a tool. So this is one this is to remind me of tools. This is my one of my favorite tools. <laughs> but this is not the tool that we built. Next slide. We did something called GWA. So if you Google GWA, next slide. You get a bunch of things. <laughs> but the one that we were after, next slide, is this thing, genome-wide association. Next slide. So this is, again, pioneered with, with animals, in this case, with humans. And the idea, you want to associate genetic variation with phenotypic variation. And that's how we're going to study adaptation. And so in humans, a, a classic way to do that in organisms as, as uh, Rod and others can tell you, is you cross two parents and you collect a bunch of progeny and you look for the traits in the progeny that were different in the parents. Can't do that with humans, right? It's not going to work. Um, even if you could do it, it would take a long time to get enough population. You couldn't get enough from one pair. So 
what people do, what people have done, is they look at a collection of humans, and they look for traits that they care about, in this case, diabetes. So you get 500 people that have diabetes and 500 that don't, sequence their genomes, and then associate the variation in their genomes with those two traits. And you'll find a bunch of different genes that contribute to it. Next slide. So for example, this study had 1,300 individuals. And among those individuals, they had almost 400,000 single nucleotide polymorphisms, which mean, means a single place in the genome where there's variation in the human population, in this 1,000 people. And it, you know there are four bases at each position in your DNA. And there are always just two in the human population, or really in any population. You never seem to find more than two. So that, we thought we could do this. Next slide. So here I'm going to tell you who we is. Louise Glass is a, a woman at Berkeley who studies, a professor who studies um, molecular biology at Neurospora, same fungus. Rachel Bram is a brand new professor um, who studies how to associate genetic variation in yeast, but we managed to entice her to think about Neurospora and me. And next slide. So we wrote the grant. These are the people that really did the work. Charles, David, and Julie are in Louise's class, and they, you know, Louise's lab, and they grew the fungi and isolated the DNA and sent it off to get the genomes sequenced. And Chris Ellison was in my lab, and he analyzed the data. And it, the first sequence of a Neurospora, a Neurospora crescent, I think cost about $400,000. And I, I think that's right. And No, excuse me. Yeah, no, $400,000. And each strain now, we, we, we're still doing this business, each new individual we do costs $250. So the cost in sequencing the genome has dropped. Wow. Next slide. So here, this is another one of these phylogenetic trees, but now species of Neurospora, not a whole kingdom of fungi, but species in one genus. Next slide. And we are looking at this genus, Neurospora crassa, and we picked it because it was the one that had that $400,000 genome, a really nice genome to compare the other ones to. Next slide. And in crassa, there are three groups, A, B, and C, three clades. And we picked this one because A, because it had the really nicely sequenced individual, and it's all around the Gulf of Mexico. So I assured everybody this was going to be one population. When you do genome-wide association, it has to be one population. For example, you couldn't sequence humans and chimps and expect to learn anything about humans. We'd only learn about differences between humans and chimps. Next slide. So we just worked on this one. Next slide. So I'm going to talk to you about when we had 63 strains sequenced. Now remember there were 1,000 humans. We were aiming for 100, 100 neurospora. And when we had 63, we stopped, and I said to Chris, we better take a look at this and see if this is going to work. And he found that among those 63, we had 130,000 SNPs. And because Neurospora has a much smaller genome than humans, we actually had a higher density of SNPs than in humans. In other words, more variation. Next slide. But we got a big surprise when Chris analyzed the data. Instead of one population, we had several populations. And fortunately, two of them, the Louisiana population, this one, and a Caribbean population that's in Haiti, Florida, and Yucatan, but spread throughout there. We had two populations with enough individuals to do something. So this was bad news for genome-wide association. And we've gone on, and we have 100 individuals from Louisiana now, and we're doing that. But it was great for studying divergence and adaptation, something we didn't dream that we were going to be able to do. So if you look at where these strains are, the Louisiana ones, you can see it, are in yellow there, and the Caribbean ones are in the pinkish orangish color. So they're geographically separated. Next slide. And in fact, the Louisiana population is a little north of the Caribbean population. And it's just as hot in the summer in the Caribbean and in Louisiana. But in the winter, it's colder in Louisiana by about 10 degrees Celsius. In other words, it can snow in Louisiana, but it does not snow. It does not snow in Caribbean. 
And you'll also notice that um, the Caribbean population is quite large, but apparently there's gene flow among these uh, diff different regions, enough to keep it together. So remember those male gametes that I showed you, those spores that were being made on the surface of the cooked plants? They get around, it looks like. Next slide. Now the next thing that Chris did was to compare <coughs> the genomes. And what we thought we were going to find, we thought we were going to find a low level of divergence with some regions where there was very little divergence. But instead, we found a few regions where there was extreme divergence. We were completely unprepared for that. And in fact, these regions where the two populations are extremely different are so different that they couldn't evolve in the amount of time that these two populations have been separated, which we estimate to be about half a million years. They had to come from somewhere else. So there are populations of Neurospora that we've not sampled that donated genes to these populations by making hybrids and then those hybrids back crossed into, into the Louisiana population or the Caribbean population. And some genes then swept into the population because they conveyed some advantage to those populations. Next slide. Could those uh, uh, then be extinct so that you don't have that pool? It's around? possible that they're gone, yeah. yeah. We don't know. We, we are going to have to do more work to try to find them. And that's, that can be hard. That's hard, because you don't know where to look. So is there gene exchange between other species, like bacteria? Um, OK, so bacteria, um, bacteria are about uh, 2 billion years distant from any of these fungi. So there's not much gene exchange. There are examples where bacterial genes are in fungi. And an example is a group I didn't, didn't talk about, the Neocalamastigales. They're obligate dwellers in the, in the guts of ruminants. And they have a one-day life cycle. The cow mm -hmm. brings in the food, chews it up, puts it in the rumen stomach. And these fungi release their little zoospores. They swim to the new plant material. They aim for the midrib in the leaf, the toughest part. They put their little rhizoids into that and break it up into smaller bits, and then bacteria help chew it up. There are bacterial genes in those fungi, probably because they've been in close proximity, and the bacterial DNA could move into the fungus. But most fungi don't have it, and it's very few genes. But what I'm talking about here is movement among populations of one species of fungus. So it would be akin to when Europeans first got to the New World and encountered the indigenous people. <clears throat> different populations of humans then started to exchange genes. So it's more like that. Next slide. Oh, let's go back. So these regions of extreme diversions are called speciation islands. <clears throat> Next slide. And the thinking is they're like these islands in a tidal river here, that the river is gene flow between the populations maybe at a number of, maybe at many loci. But these islands don't move between the populations because they contain genes that facilitate the adaptation of each population to something slightly different in the environment. So in those regions, you ought to find the genes that are responsible for adaptation. Next slide. So here's what they look like. We found two of them, okay? We, we found, actually, we've had candid, about 30 candidates, but there are a lot of ways that you can be misled by artifacts. And so when we tried all the ways of thinking, had we been misled, we trimmed it down to two. So here's what, here's what an island of divergence, or a speciation island, looks like. And I'm going to walk up to it and talk loudly. And if you can't hear in the back, when I do that, raise your arm. So here, the rows are individual fungi, are individual neurospores. And the columns are the places in their genome, in this region of the genome, where each nucleotide position shows variation. Now, remember I said it's about one every 400 shows variation. So this thing is really thousands of base pairs long. And I've thrown out every position where there's no variation. So I've squeezed it in to just show the variable positions. 
And where there's this divergence, you can see a sharp line here. And it correlates with Louisiana versus the Caribbean. So that's this region that when Chris scanned through the genome, it looks so different because it's really different. Next slide. So if you look outside of that region, you don't see a sharp line. There's no differentiation. And also, if you look in the region, you'll see that often it's invariant within each population. There's no variation within the population. But if you look outside, the variations spread everywhere. So these are different. These are the regions that came in by hybridization with a, a population that we don't know about yet, and then swept through the recipient population so rapidly that they haven't had time to make, have a lot of new mutations in those areas. So it's recent. Next slide. So what you want to know then is what genes are in those regions, okay? So here is a phospholipase. This is a gene that we know it makes a protein. We know the protein is in the outer mitochondrial membrane. We have no idea what it does. <laughs> And this is a MRH4-like. It's called like because yeast has a gene that's called MRH4, and this one is like it. And um, next slide. It seemed interesting to us. Next slide. Because in Neurospora, it's made in the nucleus, but it functions in the mitochondria. And in the literature, this protein is found in a lot of bacteria, in cyanobacteria, in bacillus, another bacterium, and then in archaea, another group of prokaryotes. And what that protein does is protect against cold shock. Next slide. And you'll remember that it's colder in Louisiana, so we thought, hmm, maybe temperature's involved. Next slide. So this is the other speciation island. And it's got a number of genes. And the gene that immediately caught our attention, first, next slide, is this thing, FRQ, short for frequency, and known as freak. <laughs> and it's the most famous gene in Neurospora. Next slide. Because Neurospora has a circadian clock, just like we do. In fact, fungi have circadian clocks because they shoot their spores at certain times of the day tuned to when it's moist and when the wind is blowing, things like that. And so it's the, it's the, the uh, oscillator in the clock. Next slide. And there's a latitudinal difference between the population, so there's a day, day length difference. And also, biological clocks have to be temperature compensated. If it gets warmer, the clock has to deal with that or it won't work. So, and in fact, that's the way of defining that it's a really, truly a, a biological clock is doesn't temperature compensate. So it's possible temperatures involved here, too. Next slide. Now, um, we didn't do anything more with FREAK because you really have to be an expert in chronobiology to work with them. The, the clocks are reset by light, of course. They're also reset by shifts in temperature. So you have to have a lab that is completely um, isolated from the normal shift in temperature that buildings have, so we just didn't have that. But there was another gene there, PAC-10 like, and PAC-10 is a is a gene that makes a protein that um, it's it's in a group called chaperones, and chaperones typically protect proteins against heat shock. But there's one group of chaperones, the prefoldins that protect the cytoskeletal proteins in cells against cold shock. And that's what PAC-10 is. Next slide. And again, there's a difference in temperature between Louisiana and the Caribbean. So it was getting pretty clear that temperature was something we had to look at. Next slide. So the first thing we did was to get 10 strains from Louisiana and 10 from the Caribbean and grow them at 25 degrees Celsius and 10 degrees Celsius, so warm and cold. And then we plotted their growth rate at the cold temperature over uh, as a fraction of their growth rate at the warmer temperature. And so here, on this scale, this is the growth at 10 degrees as a, as a fraction of that at 25. You can see right off the bat, they don't like it cold. They grow 20% as fast 
even at the best. But here's the Louisianas, and here's the Caribbean, and the mean growth is higher in Louisiana at the low, at, as, for the low temperature as a function of what it can grow at the warmer temperature, and it's significantly different. So we tried to defeat our, to destroy our hypothesis that temperature was involved, but we couldn't. So the idea that temperature was involved survived. Next slide. So now, another reason that we picked Marastra is that other people, um, led by Jay Dunlop at Dartmouth, had gone through and knocked out individually every gene that could be knocked out in Neurospora crassa. And there's a collection of strains, about 6,000 strains, um, that have that. So you can just send an email and say, I'd like to have a strain that has this particular gene knocked out. Next slide. So we did that. We got knockouts for each of the genes that we thought that were in those speciation islands. And this is a simple experiment. We just grew them at 10 degrees to see how well the knockouts did. And you can see, next slide, there, there are actually two cool things here. First, here's a wild type. This is the, un, this is the wild one, no knockout, no gene, gene deletion. You can see that a number of these genes don't affect growth. That's a good thing. If every knockout affected growth, we wouldn't have anything special about our genes. So most of them didn't affect growth. But we thought three of them might be implicated. Certainly the, the PAC-10, which <laughs> looked like a good candidate. And we thought maybe the uh, dead box RNA helicase, the MRH4 might, and also this outer mitochondrial protein of unknown function might be involved. So then we did a, a, a more careful experiment for those three. We made it a strain that doesn't have the gene with a wild type. And we picked progeny. We got five progeny that inherited the wild type allele and five that inherited the damaged allele. And we can tell that because when they, when they knock out a gene, they put in a piece of DNA that knocks out the gene and adds a gene for an antibiotic resistance. So we can just test the progeny for resistance to the antibiotic. If they're resistant, we know that it's the knockout, and if they're susceptible, it's the wild type. So we did that for those three genes. Next slide. And then we did a more careful experiment. We grew them at 10 degrees and at 25. <coughs> so this is the RNA helicase, the MRH4-like gene. And hygromycin minus means they're, they're uh, damaged by the antibiotics, so they have the wild type allele. And they did better than those that were hygromycin resistant that had the knockout. So, uh, so again, we couldn't defeat our hypothesis that this RNA helicase <coughs> was involved in protection against cold. <coughs> and so that <coughs> it remains a gene that we think may be involved in adaptation to lower temperatures. <coughs> Next slide, please. <coughs> and so we did the same thing with the prefolding, the PAC-10 like gene. And again, the wild type of veal, <coughs> the natural veal, um, individuals that they will do better at the low temperature than if they're missing it. So those two proteins <coughs> survived the test. The outer mitochondrial membrane protein didn't. So we have two candidates for genes that confer adaptation to the colder temperature. And Neurospora crassa is typically thought of as tropical and subtropical. So the Louisiana population is moving north, I think. Next slide. <coughs> to make this valid, do you have to use something besides temperature to, to say that these are not, you know, just whatever you expose them to that's different in the environment that they don't respond the same way? No, that's a good question. There could be, there could be other factors. We've only got one. Um, but we were, we were looking, we're, we're doing the easy experiment here because we're looking at the genes that were in those regions that were introgressed and that should have by theory, it should have genes that are involved in adaptation. We certainly claim, can't claim that we have that we understand all the factors that allow the Louisiana population to live where it does <coughs> compared to the Caribbeans. For example, they're different plants, and so there could be genes involved in that. But we haven't tested that. We've only tested temperature. 
does this uh, fungus, how far north does it go? Is Louisiana the far north? For Crassa, that's about as far north as it gets. There's another species of Neurospora, Neurospora discreta, that until about 2000 was thought also to be subtropical. And Don Natvig, my first postdoc, who's now at, um, at New Mexico, University of New Mexico, found it at Mile High in Albuquerque well north of where we expected it. It's colder. And then we started to look for it. And Dealey and I, in fact, uh, last summer, um, sampled a population in Fairbanks, Alaska. So <laughs> discreta gets far north. And you, as you might guess, we're looking at that now. I have a postdoc, uh, postdoc from France who's sequencing. He sequenced 50 discreta genomes going from California up to Alaska to look to see if temperature, again, is involved in that. <clears throat> the point I want to make here is that a short while ago I told you that we didn't know what the environmental factors were. We didn't know what the phenotype was. And we had no idea about what genes might be involved. And like the people who worked on the mammals, they could see what the environment was, the lava. Um, they could see the phenotype, dark coat, light coat, and they could guess about the genes. So we had no idea. So we went about it completely backwards. Next slide. First, we found the genes by sequencing the genomes. Then we guessed at the environmental factors, and then we did some tests to see if that environmental factor was involved, and in fact, it is. So we call this reverse ecology. <laughs> the other one's forward ecology. And I think it's going to be really valuable with microbes, where you really don't know what the factors are. Well, now, of course, temperature is probably involved in a lot of them. Um, but it also can be useful in bigger organisms. For example, Michael Nachman knows that, um, that the coat is important, but there could be other things important to adaptation. For example, temperature. It's a lot hotter for a little mammal on the lava where it can't get such a nice burrow and it's very absorptive <coughs> on the sand. So I've given him some trouble about that, and he's actually sequencing a bunch of his mice now to do what we did, to look at it without a bias see if all, all genes can be involved. So <clears throat> that's the message, reverse ecology. Next slide. So you always have to thank everybody who helped. And I mentioned almost all of the people here. Chris Ellison, as I said, was my student who did the analyses. Rachel and Louise and I wrote the grant. Charles, David, and Julie grew the fungi, extracted the DNA, made the libraries to get them sequenced. And also, um, Charles, Charles has gone on to his own work on real genome-wide association with Neurospora. And David has also got his own work on, uh, on uh, interesting genes that are, that are in these fungi. And then David Jacobson at the bottom has been, he was a longtime collaborator with me, and he actually lives on the peninsula. And he's uh, been instrumental in collecting, making collections of fungi. And Neurospora has, at least 5,000 individuals available in a, in a well-supported, well-run culture collection. And each little individual can be stored in a tiny little tube. Um, they're immortal. You, know, you can work with them. And if you mistreat the one in the Petri dish, you've still got it. And so you can just start it again, unlike a mouse, for example. And then <coughs> more taxes have helped us. The National Institute of Health, the National Science Foundation, this is the Fungal Genetic Stock Center that keeps all these strains, supported by the National Science Foundation. And then Chris Ellison got a, uh, had a fellowship at Berkeley, funded by, um, by a man who honored one of our former chancellors, Chang Chen. Chen. So we were very grateful for that. Next slide. So I'd be happy to take any questions. What does the Latin mean in your... In your <laughs> Any Latin scholars? <laughs> Something about Let it rot. <laughs> Instead of let it rot. Rot. Yeah. There could be. They're, they're probably low because... The Caribbean, Caribbean collections were made by David Perkins, uh, who was a professor at Stanford, the late David 
and a, a real giant in the Rossborough. And he would go to Burns in wherever he was at a meeting, look for burned vegetation, and then isolate the strains and put them in an envelope and mail them home to us. <laughs> and so uh, my guess is, well, I don't know. My guess is that they were pretty low. Because there aren't that many high-altitude fires. Well, usually the cities are low, and he was probably at a meeting. <laughs> he wasn't. Yeah. yeah. So you did your experiments with 6,000 knockouts. Does that imply there are 6,000 genes in Neurospora? There are actually 10, about 9,000 genes in Neurospora. Some, for some genes, you cannot knock them out and have the strain live. And then others have just been hard to do. And so when you look at the various Kingdom phylum is it straightforward the complexity is related to gene number or is that too simple? No, it's too simple. Yeah, okay. <coughs> they all they've all got about that many genes, except that the microspiridae have, have very many fewer genes. And they depend on the host um, for genes and also gene products. They're really good parasites. Very Yeah. I, I had a question about collecting, you know, we talk about sudden oak death, I think Actually, sudden oak death is caused by a, an oomycete, oh. which is, has the morphology of a fungus, is studied by mycologists, but is more closely related to things like diatoms mm -hmm. than the kingdom fungi. Well, my, my question was actually about collecting, and I was just wondering what precautions, since you, know, you had the, the frog fungus and all that, about when you collecting various places, what kind of precautions do you take for for collecting neurospora, um, none. <laughs> you know, um, it doesn't. It's. It doesn't do anything harmful that anybody knows about. And but you do have to protect yourself because you're in a place where it's burned about a week ago, or ten days ago, and so you've got to sort of watch where you, where you are, and you want to wear the oldest clothes you have <laughs> because they will be covered with charcoal, and also a hat. I have to have a hat because if you run your head into these branches, it, you they hurt, and also you look really bad with these big black stripes. <laughs> but yeah, we don't we don't take any particular precautions. There actually, not, there's not a lot of life there at that moment. I guess I was just thinking about moving things around the planet more. Well, that's a really good point. Moving things around a planet, the planet is a problem. In the case of there's some cases where where they were. Clearly, in a, you know, inadvertent things. Um, it's quite likely that herpetologists moved Batrachochytrium around initially, the muddy boots hypothesis. There's a fungus that's killing uh, bats. You may have read about white nose disease, geomyces. That was almost certainly spread by spelunkers. Um, it looks like it's a European fungus that European bats don't have a problem with because they evolved with it, but our bats. Our insectivorous bats have a problem with it. Then the sudden oak death, that looks like it was shipped. It was a nursery. It was shipped around in living plants. There's a big trade in living plants, intercontinental trade, and there are people whose livelihood depends on it, but it's really a bad idea because it brings fungi into contact with hosts that they didn't evolve with, and so then it is, can be a big problem. And we, we, the, we in the United States, um, we do some crazy things economically. We'll ship unmilled <laughs> logs to other countries to support their, because those people need logs for their mills, and we import unmilled logs into this country to keep some of our lumber mills going. And you know, there are laws involved in some countries, the dimensions of the boards are different than the ones we can produce, so they won't allow our boards in, but they'll allow our wood in, our trees in. And one day we're going to move a tree that brings in a fungus that kills all the Douglas fir. Yeah. Then we're going to have then we're going to have a big problem. So even when it was known that the plants had sudden oak death, they could not stop them from being shipped around. And it took some time to get the legal machinery to do that. So it's a it's a problem. The intercontinental transport of 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 fungi 
or muscles or, or organisms is bad news and it's eventually going to reduce reduces biodiversity. Fish. Fish. Yeah. Do fungi live in the human body? Do fungi live in the human body? Yes. <laughs> yes. Yeah, they live on the human body and in the human body. So we've got one called Malassezia that's really well adapted to us and it likes lipid. So it's on your head and it's all over, but it's, you can isolate it from your head, forehead and nose is a good place. It causes dandruff. Oh. So, head and shoulders paid to sequence its genome, the first genome. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, then the, and others now have been sequenced. Um, Candida albicans is a fungus mm. that's on us, well, not on all of us, maybe about 60% of us. And it causes um, thrush, mm. disease in the mouth, it causes diaper rash, mm -hmm. babies, it causes vaginitis. Um, then there's some fungi that there are fungi in our lungs. Pneumocystis is in our lungs. Uh, we've got microspiridae in our guts. But healthy individuals keep those at bay in general. Um, many of us have athlete's foot, which is the disease of shoes. If we walked around barefoot, we wouldn't have it. Um, and but, and it's, it spreads. Most fungi you acquire from the environment. But athlete's foot is one that spreads host to host. And, it, and that also it will get your toenails, oncomycosis. But then there are also some fungi that cause disease in otherwise healthy people. And California has one. It's, the disease is coccidiotomycosis, or the San Joaquin Valley fever fungus. And, uh, and then there's a, one in the East Coast, histoplasma, in the Ohio and Mississippi River Valleys, and then blastomyces north of that. There's one in Latin America, paracoxidiotomycosis. They're all close relatives. And they're all soil born. They're in the soil, yeah. and, and the, the soil in the soil, they're really associated with small mammals. And so the mammal gets it, uh, grows in the mammal. The mammal beats it, walls it off in, in its lung, as do humans. In, in Bakersfield County in the 40s, it went through and skin tested people. 90% of the people had this fungus. But only a half a percent get really sick. Maybe 10% go to the clinic. So it's in you for life. But your immune system is walled off, but it's alive. Aspergillosis is one yeah. of the fungi you mentioned. It does, but, but coxie is interesting because it's in the small mammals. It does the same thing. When the small mammal dies, temperature drops, immune system goes away, fungus is still there. It eats the small mammal and makes a lot of spores. So the spores are in the soil, but they're really associated with, with these mammals. It did not evolve with humans, because we've only been in the New World for 20 or 30,000 years. So it evolved with the small mammals. So there are a lot of fungi associated with us. So when you say small mammals, are you talking about mice? Mice. Kangaroo rats, pocket mice, okay. native mammals. Ground squirrels? No, not so, I, no, I haven't heard so much ground squirrels. It's in, when they, there's a marine mammal act. Any marine mammal that dies has to be autopsy. It gets sea lions. What does that? Is not clear? A question about dry rot, the dry rot fun fungus, and I've forgotten the names. A, a year ago, I studied this because I was trying to figure out. It says it can continue. It, it needs a certain amount of moisture to get started in the wood, and then, it, but it can grow beyond that into a lower level moisture.